We are learning more about the man at the center of a foil terror plot here in New York City. A law enforcement official says the 21 year old suspect considered assassinating President Obama. He also allegedly thought about hitting the New York Stock Exchange. Ultimately, Quasi Nafi selected the Federal Reserve as his target. On Wednesday, he drove what he believed to be a truck bomb to the building in downtown Manhattan and then he tried to detonate it. Turns out the FBI was setting him up all along. Joining us this morning is John Miller, CBS News senior correspondent. So John, there's so many interesting tidbits here, but I want to start off with the latest. What's happening? Benita, what they're doing now that they've passed the undercover phase and completed the arrest is they're backing up through the case. People they saw along the way, things they noticed. So they have done the search of the suspect's apartment. They've got his computer. They've found disks and thumb drives. They're going to go through all that media and see what is on it. Are there training films? Are there Al-Qaeda messages? Um, are there any indications that he's had contact with the Al-Qaeda network overseas, as he claimed, allegedly, in the undercover phase? But they're also going backwards through a bunch of people, people he went to school with in Missouri, people he was going to school with in New York City, to say, well, what did he say? Did he mention anything? Did he talk about other plots? Did he talk about uh, overseas travel and training? And, and that's, um, that's going to go on for a while, really, till they understand every aspect of his world. Obviously, he's under the microscope now, but I'm just curious, how long had he been under the microscope previous to this terror plot? How long had the FBI been looking at him? Not very long. One of the remarkable things about this plot, Benita, is how quickly it developed. In a typical scenario, one of these develops over the course of a year or a year and a half. In this case, he arrived in the United States in January. Um, by July, he was dealing with the FBI. By August, he was doing the surveillances of his targets, looking at the stock exchange, looking at the Federal Reserve, studying targets, um, up until the time he allegedly pressed the button uh, this week. As you told me, I mean, he came to the U.S. to study. He wanted to look into cybersecurity. What happened to this young man, 21 years old? How do you go from someone who wants to come to the U.S. with parents who think they're spending their last dime to give you a better ed education to someone who wants to bomb the Federal Reserve? So that's an interesting question because there's two versions of it. One, there's his version, which he says on tape to the undercovers, allegedly, which is, I came to the United States expressly for the purpose of developing and launching a terrorist attack in the name of Al-Qaeda. Or two, it's what we're learning from the um, investigators' interviews from the people who went to school with him who said he seemed like a regular kid in the beginning, then he was, got, got very political, then more radical, then more strident to the point that we were no longer comfortable even talking to him. So is, is this something he came intending to do, or was this a radicalization that developed and if so, from where? The key is, uh, there's very little dispute about this because his friends and the investigators both agree on this, is that he was taken by the messages of the late uh, Al-Qaeda cleric and spokesman Amwar al-Awlaki, uh, who advocated uh, violent jihad. If he didn't come to the U.S. like this, how hard is it for the FBI when you're looking at someone that has no obvious red flags? How do you find them or can you find them when they're trying to get into the country? Well, there certainly is a profile, and it's almost useless. <laughs> it is that the, the, the potential terrorist is generally male between uh, 18 and 30. But that's about it, because you see, in this case, his father was a bank official in Bangladesh. He came from what would, would have been an upper middle class home there. We have seen um, people come from very poor backgrounds, um, angry with the world. But we've seen, and you can go right back to the 9-11 hijackers, college-educated people from middle-class homes with advanced degrees. So there really is no profile. What you have to go on is the intelligence. Now, when somebody applies for a visa, they are run through systems like TIDE, the Terrorist Identities Data Mart Environment, a massive computer system that makes connections between names and email addresses and nicknames and terrorism communications across the globe. But most of these guys that we've encountered in the cases that we've been covering are really people who had no arrest record, had basically flown under the radar, and that this act, whatever it was, was going to be the first bad thing they ever did. Between the underwear bomber and the Times Square bomber, it seems as though the FBI is increasing efficiency, and it sounds like you're agreeing with that. You know, there have been 300 arrests in terrorism cases since 9-11, uh, which is a lot more than most people think. And of those, about 100 of those have been involved with people who are actually in plots to go do something, launch some attack, 
and about 25 of them have been cases like this where the FBI inserted itself for in, in, in the scenario where somebody was looking to find al-Qaeda to get help to launch an attack. Well, it certainly should be fascinating to see what that information that's now been seized sheds light in terms of what this young man was thinking. CBS News senior correspondent John Miller, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Vanita.